right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Felix Keo, who is up in Edmonton in Canada. How are you doing, Felix? I'm doing great today, John. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. And Felix has been featured in the Huffington Post, Ad Week, Authority Magazine. Uh, he's a speaker. Uh, he's been on radio and podcasts speaking about neuromarketing and even neuromarketing in the 2019 Canadian election. And Felix, you're the founder of Happy Buying Brain, Edmonton's best neuromarketing company. And today we're just going to talk about the subject of neuromarketing. So let's just baseline this for anybody who's watching right now is um, what, what is neuromarketing? Yeah, absolutely. So neuromarketing, the easiest way to put it is you're applying or combining neurosciences with um, sales and marketing strategies that will empower companies to solve their business challenges more effectively. Um, so just to give you more of a concrete and crystallized um, picture of how that works. So the when you look at the brain, right, the brain is mm -hmm. really divided into two parts. So everybody understands the logical part, right, which is your yeah. cortex. But there's a less unknown part, which is called your primal brain. So that's really where the, your subconscious mind lives. And it influences up to 95% of your daily activities. So that would include consumers buying behaviors. And because it operates below the level of consciousness, that's something that's largely overlooked by you know, a lot of companies in terms of how they structure their marketing campaigns. So um, you know, when we focus, uh, show companies how to craft their marketing, so it speaks to the primal part of the consumer's brain, they're able to create that emotional connection that builds brand loyalty with their consumers um, on a much uh, you know, deeper uh, level there. So that, uh, that strong connection is absolutely crucial, especially in today's time with um, you know, all the movements and all the um, kind of uh, discord that's happening. Yeah. So could you give me um, just some examples maybe of, of brands or, or organizations that really do this well so that people can, get it, can sort of go, oh yeah, actually, no, I, I understand the concept. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of it is, um, you know, one of the main kind of like subconscious drivers or that um, really, because what we do is because you know how we're stuck a lot yeah. in our daily habits. So up to, you know, 60,000 thoughts that run through our minds, it's actually, you know, a vast majority is that is on repeat. So now, you know, brands have to find a way to kind of break that, uh, that pattern of thinking, right? So that they start to stand out. So how do they create that sense of novelty now? So that it, um, so they don't get glossed over. And you know, one example is uh, Energizer. So everybody knows Energizer, which is a fantastic mm -hmm. uh, battery company, right? So um, you know, they've been around for thirty plus years. So there's only so many uh, commercials that they could produce where you're watching a pink bunny, um, yeah. you know, just bang on the drums, and uh, you know, and you keep on hearing the saying, it keeps going and going and going. But um, you know, this more in recent years, this over, uh, I believe it's a 2017 or 2018 um, commercial that they released. Uh, what was really neat is um, they changed things up. So they had a 15 second commercial, but halfway through it, what would happen was um, the bunny would actually stop, turn around to the camera. So that would cause a shift in terms of mm -hmm. what we call an orientation response. So that causes the mind to be like, oh, like how come like I'm used to the bunny just kind of just marching <laughs> off into the distance. So now the viewer looks at that and then um, with that one turn of the bunny, it catches the, um, you know, the viewer's attention. And that's what continues to break that pattern interruption and it registers on a much more um, subconscious level on the consumer. So they're a good example of, you know, how they implemented pattern interruptions into their marketing to continue to be innovative, to, you know, continue to engage mm -hmm. with their consumers. Yeah, because, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we kind of zone our way through lives, uh, mm -hmm. life today, and we're bombarded with so many messages and so many devices uh, you know, shouting out for our attention that we've become very good at kind of blurring everything and not really paying that much attention. So obviously, uh, what you're talking about here with neuromarketing is a way of snapping us out of that that kind of trance, if you like, for a moment and, and getting our, us to connect with something. Exactly. Like that's one of the uses for sure, because as you mentioned, right, um, you know, with everything that's going on, there's just so many different mediums and distractions happening. Uh, people are on their phones, on, you know, they, they're looking at multiple um, 
you know, uh, media at the same time. They, they have their, not only their phones, but their iPads, and then they also have their desktops and then all the other um, advertising and everything around them. So now it's a way consumers or uh, brands have to find a way to break through, you know, all that noise, but do it in a way where it's still re- respectful of the consumer, mm-hmm. but um, engage them in a way where they will want to pay attention to those brands there. So when you work with, uh, with your clients, um, mm-hmm. what, what's the process that you go through uh, with them to, to, get their, to get their messaging and to get their whole branding correct? Yeah, so when we work with a company, the first thing we do is the discovery call, the breakthrough call is um, mm-hmm. definitely the most important. That sets the tone for everything. So we like to look at um, not only their core messaging, but also you know, their, what they're doing in their marketing as well. Um, and also, are they targeting uh, the right people? So, you know, we see that some people, even though they have the best brands, but they're not um, getting in front of the right right audience. So, you know, the first step is always identifying, you know, who is your ideal customer avatar, right? So um, from there on, you know, we're able to match up in terms of um, the type of brand messaging that's going to resonate with them. And then where are they found uh, online? So, you know, it's kind of like a three-part uh, Uh, process there and then um, you know we also look at what are the biggest problems that are preventing them from achieving you know each one of those stages there and then how would their business look once their um, those problems are solved so um, you know that's very important because uh, not only do you solve the problem but we have to paint the picture of you know how will the future look in terms of when all their um, when you provide the solution to those problems and pain points. So when you're working on the on the target buyer or brand avatar, uh, how often mm. do you find that it's either too vague, too broad, or uh, that it's really kind of not the not the correct target? Uh, usually, it could be both. We found I think um, we found both where it's the, their targeting is too broad and they niche, need to niche down, or you know the people that they were getting in front of was uh, you know the a demographic that that really didn't resonate with their product. Um, So, you know, that's something that, you know, it it comes with testing with the brand messaging to see when you put that brand message in front of that particular um, audience to see if that's something that connects with them on an emotional level. But yes, uh, we have seen both. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just a matter matter of like looking at who they're targeting and then um, seeing, um, you know, like why are the reasons that, uh, their core messaging is not resonating and then it's either a matter of changing the core messaging or a matter of, uh, you know, identifying who their uh, true ideal customer avatars are. And then how, how difficult is it sometimes for companies to, because to make a switch to marketing, as you said, and, and mm-hmm. connecting marketing on a more emotional level, I mean, that may feel a little alien to some organizations, right. particularly if they've marketed in a, in a, traditional way or market in the same way for a while how do you how do you help them with that uh, transition well we just explain that as humans we're we have more than just our logical minds right Mm -hmm. so a lot of us um you know we have uh, other different uh drivers that um, influence our behaviors so i believe that um what ends up happening if they're finding that their marketing is not working then what ends up happening is they're looking for solutions outside of what they're currently doing so once we're able to help them understand that, look, this is, if this is what you're doing and you're not getting results from it, then there's no point continue on because that's the mm-hmm. definition of insanity, right? You're just repeating things that, um, you know, have a low success rate. So that's how we open things up to include that um, the brain actually has a lesser known component, but it's the real decision maker uh, and when it comes to, uh, you know, the consumer buying process. And that's when we segue into explaining, you know, like how it works And um, also, you know, how their consumers think on that level and what they could do, what changes that they could do to their brand and their mission and vision statements so that they can now start connecting to their uh, audience beyond just, let's say, a logical level, but on the level where the subconscious drivers are are truly, you know, influencing Mm -hmm. the consumer's behavior. So, um, so can you explain for people, what does that, what does that look like? I mean, people are obviously probably aren't very good at analyzing their own right. <laughs> consumer behavior, but when you, when you react or when your primal or reptilian brain mm-hmm. um, makes the buying decision or 
as opposed to the logical brain or certainly over ones. What is that? What is that reaction like? How can people even look at themselves and recognize, OK, I get it that I'm actually making that that I'm reacting to that product or service in, in, in that way? Well, in let's just look way. at, for example, let's look at uh, industry categories, for example. So mm -hmm. let's look at athletic brands. Right. So when someone buys an athletic brand, for example, what are they truly buying into? Right. But so they're, they're buying into the people who wear that. Exactly. So you have the ability to not only associate with, let's say, your idol for whatever mm -hmm. sports it is. So you start to identify with it, but also it makes you feel more connected to that person or to that brand. That's why mm -hmm. there's a big difference in the market value when you, we buy just a generic jersey versus the markup of, let's say, mm -hmm. a famous, um, you know, like sports player on it. Right. Mm -hmm. So what that does connect is it also connects the person with the status of that person and being almost in a way indirectly, even though they don't play for that organization, but it's almost like somebody wears that Jersey because it, it, a lot of those qualities also, they believe transfers to them as well. So that's why you see not like a lot of people buying, um, let's say sports jerseys with their favorite players. And then they go mm -hmm. on the field and they play because a lot of that confidence and uh, you know, the, the success that comes with that particular person and even the status of that person begins to rub off on them and that's how it changes the way that they perform even on the on the on the field so that's one example you know another example is um you know like if you look at even luxury items um let's mm -hmm. say luxury cars um for example like why do people buy luxury cars it's obviously a status symbol so it's the same thing right so in uh you know on on a neuroscience level status to the primal brain it, what it does is empowers people to uh, increase their chances of survival and reproduction because you have more mm -hmm. access to opportunities where you secure more resources, for example, which would enhance your survival value. And also on a reproduction level, you would have more access to say potential mates because of your status, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, that's how, that's how like the neuroscience and the neuromarketing of how somebody, when they engage with a brand, that's the, you know, the qualities that they would, in a sense, inherit as well. Yeah, which is then, it's, I mean, it makes sense. And if you look at car advertising, I know some of them nowadays try to, you know, play up safety features and this and that, mm -hmm. whatever. But the reality is they sell a lifestyle. Exactly. That's what it is. You know, diets are the same thing, right? It's, a, yeah. it's more like a lifestyle. Um, you know, it's uh, more than just taking, let's say, some sort of supplement or a smoothie. But how does it, taking that supplement now allow somebody to go out and let's say run uh, a marathon, uh, you know, that's something that they weren't able to do, or even uh, spend time with their children, for example, so they could go for a walk or, or play with their, their kids, right? Which is something that they wouldn't have to, they couldn't mm -hmm. do because of their health, they had health issues. So, you know, all those different things, um, if the advertising, the brand message focuses on, let's say, um, enabling somebody who is bedridden, for example, because of their health, but if they take this, um, let's say this supplement or this, uh, the smoothie or, or whatever it is that, that makes you healthier, then this is what, this is how your lifestyle can look like. Mm -hmm. And, and then how does this, so, I mean, a lot of people say, yeah, okay, this makes sense for, you know, B2C and consumer, but if they say, okay, I'm, I'm a B2B company and I sell, you know, heavy goods or something. So how does, how does this work for me? Perfect. Yeah. So when people do B2B, so what you're doing is you're doing more outreach to another, let's say business owner, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. So at the end of the day, that business owner, just like every other person has a primal brain. That's the, the that's the most active and they have their own, you know, uh, pain points, fears, and anxiety. So now with that type of knowledge, it's, it's up to now that particular business owner when they're engaging in that conversation to understand their, uh, the, the other business owner on that particular level, similar to in a B2C case, you know, the business would understand their consumer on that subconscious level. And that's how, you know, you craft your um, interactions and conversations so that, uh, you know, you're able to really dive down and, and really solve the real uh, pain points that's really bothering them rather than just staying on a, like a, a surface level um, interaction. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fantastic answer. And I think that's a, something just to underline for people, because at the end of the day, as I often say is, uh, you know, people forget how much emotion is tied up in 
B2B purchasing because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the time you're not even spending your own money. You're spending the company's money. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, visibility too, if the solution that you purchase works or doesn't work. So there is a right. lot of, a lot of emotion. So if you don't, if you don't market or sell to, or, or at least are aware of those emotions, you're missing the mark. Exactly. I totally in agreement with you with that, with that, John. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely identifying like a lot of people, they tend to stay away from it because they, they don't want to, let's say it could be a conflicting area or maybe mm -hmm. it could ca cause tension, but there's certain ways to, um, you know, communicate messages where they come across effectively and helpful as well. So, you know, if um, somebody like a business owner in a B2B situation is able to have those types of conversations with the other um, person on the, on the other side um, and really understand their business and let them know that they're there to help them, then, um, you know, people more often than not are going to be open to, uh, to that help. And probably now, given the, uh, the situation in the world and the pandemic mm -hmm. and all the other stuff is going on, um, at times like this, are, are we, is our, is our primal or reptilian brain and our emotions, are they a little more heightened? So maybe, you know, if you're, maybe this is something that you also need to be aware of. Oh, absolutely. Right now. So right now, the primal brain is probably at, uh, you know, the most heightened state for a lot of people across the globe. There's just so much activity, movements on, uh, you know, uh, the, the social justice, equality. Um, you know, also you have, um, it percolates into other areas as well, such as uh, greater awareness for the environment. So um, all that uh, definitely factors into how the brain perceives their, the situation. Um, because its main role is really to ensure the survival and reproductive success of the individual. And a lot of people right now are really in survival mode, right? So that's yeah. why you have, um, you know, f uh, you know, you have like feelings of fear, anxiety, uncertainty. Those um, feelings are certainly at its uh, peak right now. So, um, you know, as brands, what we need to do now, because what a brand really is, is a, a verb or an emotional state. So people are kind of like in this really heightened um, mm -hmm. emotional um, state of, you know, uncertainty, fear, even panic for a lot of people, because a lot of their basic necessities are, they don't even know where they're going to be living, for example, or where the next meal is coming out. And that, that's, you know, coming across as very common for, for pretty much all countries across the world. So now a brand has to come in. Their job is actually to bring stabilization to that emotional state. And um, that has to do with how they engage and how they show their um, consumers by aligning themselves with you know a lot of the um, new social and uh, conscious awareness that's happening so that's something that brands so, have the responsibility uh, of doing yeah aligning with that and just one more question before we go sure. given the fact that we're in an election cycle here in the u.s right now um just in case anybody missed it uh, when you did your research and that during the Canadian election, just mm -hmm. from a neuroscience point of view, was there anything that, uh, any surprising uh, insights you got from that? Uh, you know, it's very interesting to see how people, um, how they choose their party. So it's almost like, so of course, there, there's also, there's, there's cognitive biases in, uh, mm -hmm. in neuroscience or neuromarketing, right? So one of them is called the confirmation bias. So yeah. the more you read, the more you see something, what ends up happening is, so if you're on social media, for example, and you're consuming content that uh, is catered to where it's like a particular brand or a particular party, or maybe to, to you know, uh, more left or right, for example, then mm -hmm. you'll start to see the algorithm will, will understand what type of uh, content you're consuming. So it'll start to send more of that, right? So that, um, so in a way, you know, you have all these different mediums that now understand your behavior. And they start feeding more of the same stuff, um, kind of like a YouTube when you start watching a video and it yeah. recommends very similar content. So that uh, you know, definitely impacts how somebody chooses which party they will go to as well. So in a way, that's, uh, I thought that was really neat in terms of how um, you know, these platforms can be used to influence this, uh, people in terms of their belief when it comes to politics. Well, yeah, because let's face it, I mean, what do people like is when they express an opinion or, or a preference, which obviously mm -hmm. you do by the content you select. Right. Um, when you do that in real life, what do you, what do you, what do you want most? Did you want people to go, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. So exactly. if you're getting, if you're getting fed all of the opinions that uh, are, 
are in agreement with the content you selected and that content keeps flowing in many ways or essentially you're getting that confirmation right you're exactly getting, yeah yeah you're right look yeah, yeah. You're right instead of realizing that it's actually it's an algorithm exactly yeah so you're just getting more verification in terms of your viewpoint yeah. right but uh, what that yeah. does at the same time is there's there's a whole if you were to take a 360 look at everything there's multiple mm -hmm. viewpoints so you know it's just a matter of like just keeping our minds open to understanding that what we see is just one viewpoint but um, to really acknowledge the entire situation we would have to see you know like what does this party have to say about things? Maybe they have mm -hmm. some good stuff rather than creating like an us versus them mentality. Yeah. So um, I thought that was kind of neat in terms of the confirmation bias that yeah, the algorithms um, would just feed more information in that re respect. So there's nothing bad or about that. Is this a matter of like how the things work? But I think it's being conscious that, um, you know, what we're seeing, um, there could be possibly more uh, different viewpoints than what we're consuming at the moment. Yeah, no, it's very, it's really interesting. Well, listen, thanks very much, uh, um, Felix. I know we could talk about neuroscience for hours and we'll, I could ask questions and you could talk about it. But, um, <laughs> Absolutely. This, is, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Felix's information will be in this contributor bio below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company and how they can find out more. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what you could do is I'm active on LinkedIn. So, you know, I'm more than happy to connect with people on uh, LinkedIn. Just type in Felix Kale and you'll be able to find me. Also, um, at my uh, website, uh, happybuyingbrain.com. I also have mm -hmm. a blog up there. It's a great way to, you know, follow what uh, the most recent updates are happening in the world of neuromarketing and how you can apply it to, you know, your company as well. And also another way, another way to contact me is there's a contact form on the website so if you um you know have any questions or whatnot feel free to send any messages through there as well yeah listen this is fantastic uh, my name is john golden from sales pop online sales magazine and pipeliner crm thanks again felix and i will see the rest of you for another interview really soon thank you thank you <laughs>